Franz Kafka's Letters to Milena is a poignant collection of correspondence between Kafka and Milena Yasenska, a journalist and translator who was also his lover. The letters, written between 1920 and 1923, offer a deeply personal glimpse into Kafka's inner life, his struggles with his writing, and his complex relationship with Jesenska. The correspondence reveals Kafka's vulnerability and his existential concerns, as well as his affection for Jesenska. Kafka often discusses his work, his health, and his philosophical musings, all while expressing his admiration and love for her. The letters are not only a window into Kafka's personal world, but also reflect his literary genius and the intensity of his emotional landscape. Letter 1. April 1920. The rain, which has been going on for two days and one night, has just now stopped. Of course, probably only temporarily, but nonetheless an event worth celebrating, which I am doing by writing to you. Incidentally, the rain itself was bearable. After all, it is a foreign country here, admittedly only slightly foreign, but it does the heart good. If my impression was correct, evidently the memory of one single meeting, brief and half silent, is not to be exhausted. You were also enjoying Vienna as a foreign city, although later circumstances may have diminished this enjoyment. But do you also enjoy foreignness for its own sake? which might be a bad sign, by the way, a sign that such enjoyment should not exist. I'm living quite well here. The mortal body could hardly stand more care. The balcony outside my room is sunk into a garden, overgrown and covered with blooming bushes. The vegetation here is strange. In weather cold enough to make the puddles freeze in Prague, blossoms are slowly unfolding before my balcony. Moreover, this garden receives full sun, or full cloud, as it has for all, most a week. Lizards and birds, unlikely couples, come visit me. I would very much like to share Moran with you. Recently you wrote about not being able to breathe. That image and its meaning are very close to one another, and here both would find a little relief. With cordial greetings, F. Kafka. Letter 1 April 1920 Dear Frau Milena, I wrote you a note from Prague and then from Meran. I have not received any answer. It so happens the notes did not require a particularly prompt reply, and if your silence is nothing more than a sign of relative well-being, which often expresses itself in an aversion to writing, then I am completely satisfied. However, it is also possible, and this is why I am writing, that in my notes I somehow hurt you. What a clumsy hand I must have had if that should have happened against all my intentions. Or else, which would of course be much worse, the moment of quiet relaxation you described has again passed, and bad times have again descended upon you. In case the first is true, I don't know what to say. That's so far from my thoughts and everything else is so close and for the second possibility I have no advice. How could I? But just a simple question. Why don't you leave Vienna for a little while? After all, you aren't homeless like other people. Wouldn't some time in Bohemia give you new strength? And if, for reasons unknown to me, you might not want to go to Bohemia, then somewhere else, maybe even Moran would be good? Do you know it? So I'm expecting one of two things. Either continued silence, which means, don't worry, I'm fine, or else a few lines. Cordially, Kafka. It occurs to me that I really can't remember your face in any precise detail. Only the way you walked away through the tables in the cafe, your figure, your dress, that I still see. Letter 3. April 1920. Dear Frau Milena, you are toiling over the translation in the middle of the dreary Vienna world. Somehow, I am both moved and ashamed. You will have probably already received a letter from Wolf. At least he wrote to me some time ago concerning such a letter. I did not write any novella entitled Murderers, although this was apparently advertised in a catalog. 
There is some misunderstanding, but since it's supposed to be the best one of the lot, maybe it's mine after all. Judging from your last two letters, anxiety and worry seem to have left you once and for all. This probably applies to your husband as well. How much I wish it for both of you. I recall a Sunday afternoon years ago I was creeping along the wall of houses on the Franzensquai and ran into your husband heading toward me in much the same way. Two headache experts, naturally each after his very own fashion. I don't remember whether we then went on together or passed each other by. The difference between these two possibilities could not have been very great. But that is past and should remain deep in the past. Is it nice at home? Cordial greetings, Kafka. Letter 4. April, 1920. So, it's the lung. I've been turning it over in my mind all day long unable to think of anything else. Not that it alarms me. Probably, and hopefully, you seem to indicate as much. You have a mild case, and even full-fledged pulmonary disease, half of Western Europe has more or less deficient lungs, as I have known in myself for three years, has brought me more good things than bad. In my case, it began about three years ago with a violent hemorrhage in the middle of the night. I was excited as one always is by something new, naturally somewhat frightened as well. I got up instead of staying in bed, which is the prescribed treatment as I later discovered, went to the window, leaned out, went to the washstand, walked around the room, sat down on the bed, no end to the blood. But I wasn't at all unhappy, since by and by I realized that for the first time in three, four, practically sleepless years, there was a clear reason for me to sleep, provided the bleeding would stop. It did indeed stop, and has not returned since, and I slept through the rest of the night. To be sure, the next morning the maid showed up, at that time I had an apartment in the Schönborn Palais, a good, totally devoted but extremely frank girl. She saw the blood and said, Pan Doctore, you're not going to last very long. But I was feeling better than usual. I went to the office and did not go see the doctor until later that afternoon. The rest of the story is immaterial. I only wanted to say, it's not your illness which scares me, especially since I keep interrupting myself to search my memory, and underneath all your fragility I perceive something like a farm girl's vigor and I conclude, no, you're not sick. This is a warning but no disease of the lung. Anyway, it's not that which scares me, but the thought of what must have preceded this disturbance. For the moment, I'm simply ignoring everything else in your letter, such as not a heller, tea and apple, daily from two to eight. These are things I cannot understand, which evidently require oral explanation. So I'll ignore all that, though only in this letter as I cannot forget them, and just recall the explanation I applied to my own case back then, and which fits many cases. You see, my brain was no longer able to bear the pain and anxiety with which it had been burdened. It said, I'm giving up. But if anyone else here cares about keeping the whole intact, then he should share the load and things will run a little longer. Whereupon my lung volunteered, it probably didn't have much to lose anyway. These negotiations between brain and lung, which went on without my knowledge, may well have been quite terrifying. And what are you going to do now? The fact that you're being looked after is probably insignificant. Anyone who cares about you has to realize that you need a little looking after. Nothing else really matters. So is there salvation here as well? I said already. No, I'm not in the mood for making jokes. I am not being funny in the least and will not be funny again until you have written how you are planning a new and healthier way of life. After your last letter, I'm not going to ask why you don't leave Vienna for a while. Now I understand. But after all, there are beautiful places close to Vienna as well, which offer many different cures and possibilities of care. Today, I'm not going to write about anything else. I don't have anything more important to bring up. I'm saving everything else for tomorrow, including my thanks for the issue of Kamen, which makes me moved and ashamed, happy and sad. No, there is one other thing. 
If you waste as much as one minute of your sleep on the translation, it will be as if you were cursing me. For if it ever comes to a trial, there will be no further investigations. They will simply establish the fact. He robbed her of her sleep. With that, I shall be condemned, and justly so. Thus, I'm fighting for myself when I ask you to stop. Franz. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more content. See you in the next one.